so you can just talk to me mm -hmm. conversationally and all that. Right. First, start off by telling me your name, where you live, and what you do. My name is Ron Rice. Uh, I live here in Dallas, Texas, and I'm the uh, assistant manager of the Conspiracy Museum. Just a little bit of uh, background on you. Are you a native of Dallas? I no, uh, I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I moved here in 1993. What, uh, what did you do before you came here? I was a police officer. I got shot in the back. I couldn't do anymore, so I picked a more dangerous job, being a tour guide. In, in, in the line of duty. Um, you're like a patrol car officer? Right. Street? And where were you? Uh, Central in, in Indiana. So what brought you here? Well, I was writing a book on the Kennedy assassination and I came here, uh, I wanted to do a photo layout for my book and uh, Larry Howard, he was the director of the Assassination in Information Center that's no longer here. Uh, he wanted me to work for him, and after him, another guy wanted me to work for him. It's just been one job offer at, at, after another. Um, what was that assassination center? Uh, JFK Assassination Information Center. It used to be in the West End. Was that kind of like uh, the first one? Very what? similar to this. Was there any before that, or is that? Well, people tell me there used to be a place right across from the sixth floor museum at uh, 501 Elm Place. Uh, I have no idea who ran it, what, what the name of it was, but there used to be some, so, something like this right across the street from the Disinformation Center that's called the sixth floor museum. So, when did this place open? Uh, approximately eight years ago. And what were the circumstances under? Well, Larry Howard moved from the West End to here, and then he died. Of, he, he had a stroke back in 91, and he died of uh, complications from the stroke. And the, uh, the person who financed the museum, R.B. Cutler, he's a millionaire out of Massachusetts, hired a guy named Tom Bowden to financially run the museum after Larry died. And then it became the Conspiracy Museum. And you were hired right off the bat? Right. I was hired uh, from the first day, it, uh, from the first day on. We, we had to rebuild this whole thing from scratch. And uh, why, why did you choose this site? Closest spot we could find to the assassination site. So what do you, what is, do you have a mission statement here? Do you have, what is your well, philosophy? The museum's philosophy is, you know, we're not here to try to change people's minds or convince them it, it was a conspiracy or uh, stop them from believing Oswald did. We're here to do uh, what museums are supposed to do, and that is to try to tell the entire story of, of a historical event. Uh, very, very soon, in the next few weeks, everything you see behind me is going to change. We're going to put up more material on the JFK assassination for the 40th anniversary. And we're, we try to be objective and impartial. It's going to be in three parts. One's going to be the Warren Commission. Second part's going to be the House Select Committee. Third part, conspiracy. That way, nobody, nobody's opinion is left out. We're going to try to put all three parts of the story up on these walls. Um, what do you think of the other museum? Like I said, the, uh, uh, the uh, Black Hole of Disinformation Museum, uh, the Sixth Floor Museum, uh, they operate on the government agenda and they don't even address the assassination like it should be. Uh, it's mainly centered around Kennedy. Now, if you're a big fan of Kennedy, you'll love the place. But if you want to know facts about the assassination, you're going to be a little bit disappointed. And it, personally, I don't think it's worth $10 a person. That, but that's just my opinion. Now, the price used to be 7 Yeah, 7 okay.
but not tan. Um, I was uh, told by somebody that I interviewed over at the plaza that you were the person who originally calculated the position of the X. Yes, I am the mysterious X man. Yes. So, what what drove you to do that, and how did you do it? Uh, I used the supporter film, and we measured from where he stood on the cement pastel, and uh, we just uh, we just uh, drew a line right across the street, and <clears throat> then we put the car position across that line. And that's where the X is. Exactly. Well, pretty close to where he was sitting in the car. And when did you originally do that? Seven, eight years ago. <clears throat> People always wonder, who keeps putting that X in the street? Hmm, the X Man. <laughs> like they, like the X Files, the guy smoking, smoking the cigarette. <laughs> Can you tell me your personal thoughts on Kennedy? That mean the man, the man personally. The man personally, and as <clears throat> president. Well, I think Kennedy was pretty naive about uh, life and reality itself. A lot of people don't understand that Kennedy was automatically made a millionaire, as all the Kennedy kids were after they turned 21. And he didn't have to worry about the clothes on his back, the shoes on his feet, or food on the table like you and me. And he had no respect for people that had power in this country, or what we call the status quo. And it just seemed to me that he just liked to make people mad at him. They, they weren't enemies of him, they were just mad at him for the policies that he was trying to uh, create. And. Uh, He's a typical rich person that didn't know what the real world was all about. And so as a president, what do you feel he, how he did? Well, Kennedy was a man, or his, as a president, Kennedy was a president who liked change. People, people don't like changes. People don't like a, a oil depletion tax. People don't like... Uh, a civil rights act being passed. People don't like uh, the minimum wage being raised. He didn't understand that all these things cost people money. And and to him he didn't, to him it, it, he didn't care because it didn't affect him. And and these people finally got together and say, hey, this guy's not a team player. We can't find somebody to reelect him. He's too popular. So let's kill him. Nothing personal, but let's kill him. And that, that's basically what they decided to do in the summer of 1963. And so who do you feel that they was? Alan Dulles was the CIA director. He picked uh, Dallas to be the target city. J. Edgar Hoover, who wore women's underwear, by the way. Uh, J., J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, picked Oswald as a patsy. Carlos Marcello, a mafia kingpin, he hired all of the gunmen. H. L. Hunt, a greedy Texas oil uh, businessman, financed it, and Lyndon B. Johnson covered it up. And what was the process that led you to that conclusion? I mean, when did you start? 27 years of research. If, if, if you want to do something very boring and very dry, read the Warren Commission report. That's the very first thing I recommend anybody to do. First off, read the Warren Commission report. You don't have to read the 26 volumes that go with it. Just read the report and start from there. And that's what you started doing? Because, yes, because as a former police officer, you have any crime is a big jigsaw puzzle. And these pieces are who, what, when, where, how, and why. And you have to put, figure out, all, get all these pieces together and put them all back together again to create the crime. That's how you solve a crime. Who, what, when, where, how, and why. And like who could be 550 pieces. What could be uh, 200 pieces. Where could be 50 pieces. 
it, it just takes time. You just got to be patient and collect all the information. Eliminate the lesser possibilities and go with the strongest possibilities. So what encouraged you to read the Warren Report in the first place? Why did you, why because you I wanted to find out what happened to President Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963. And then what led you past that? What, what made you uncomfortable with the Warren Report? Uh, what made me uncomfortable, there was a book, and we have one in our uh, glass case t uh, to your right. It's called Six Seconds in Dallas by Josiah Thompson. That got me started thinking there were more than one gunman. Very good book. That's the best book that's ever been written until mine comes out. <laughs> well, you're, what's your, yours going to be? My, my book is going to be called Night to King Three. It's the only move in chess that's an assassination move. You're going straight for the king. And that's what they did here on November 22nd. And how far along are you? Now, it's written. It's written? Right. When's it going to be published? As soon as my publisher gets nerve, nerve enough to put it through the press, he's been kind of leery because uh, it's, it's striking too close to the truth. But he said it will be out this year sometime. I may not make it on the anniversary, but I'm not really concerned about making a de deadline. As long as it gets out, I'll, I'll be happy. Um, so you've seen a lot of anniversaries now? Yes. Yeah. Well, 10 years? Right. So what are they like in general? Well, you have the general JFK groupies, Lancer and Copa come down here. They're your uh, two major groups of three-day experts that come down here out of the whole year. I'm an expert. I came down here by airplane. I got a hotel room. I know everything about the assassination. And they don't give us or anybody else the time of day because we're only around this 365 days a year. And they don't, they don't consider us to be nothing. And that these people are so hypocritical and two-faced. Get this. We believe in conspiracy. Now let's give all of our money to the Sixth Floor Museum that covers the truth. Let's not, let's not support the conspiracy museum, even though they believe it's a conspiracy. Does that make any sense? No. So you don't like either of those groups? Either of them? JFK wannabe groupies. They're procrastinators, two-faced, hypocritical, lying people. I heard that there was a little conflict between them last year. Uh, one of them had a bullhorn and the other one didn't. Like an well, this year I'm going to issue one group baseball bats and the other one uh, uh, irons uh, golf clubs. And who, whoever's left standing wins, you know. What do you think it's going to be like? Nothing. It's not going to be no big deal. But I mean, the, the crowd. It's not going to be no big crowds. Really? No. Why do you think that? Because the last year and the year before that, you, you could tell. Smaller, smaller, smaller. I mean, people are just, they're going back to what it used to be in 1978 before the movie JFK came out. No one cared anymore. I used to go down to that plaza in the 1970s. Nobody was down there but panhandlers and drunks. No tourists, no cameras. The, uh, uh, on, the an <coughs> excuse me, on the anniversary, there's going to be more uh, reporters and media than tourists. They want to make it look on TV like it's a big deal, but it's not going to be a big deal. That's the way this country is. I mean, I, and people, people in this country are so naive that uh, they don't care to honor its history and, and the past. They just don't care. Um, thinking about the, the past, what you've lived through, do you have any presidents that you thought well of in your lifetime? Only, only one, that's Kennedy. Uh, after Kennedy, uh, we we really didn't have any real president after Kennedy. Uh, the rest of them have been nothing but uh, 
signature people. They no longer have any real power. So who do you feel has the real power? Uh, Congress and the Senate. I mean, it, after Kennedy, and especially after Johnson, uh, the, the Senate and Congress really don't trust the president. Right. What? How do you feel things actually went down? I mean, how many shooters, that kind of thing? How, how do you feel it was actually organized there? Well, actually, this this started around June in 1963. Uh, there was a government assassination team uh, that actually was authorized by President Eisenhower. Anyway, the assassination team authorized by Eisenhower uh, was de de designed to assassinate the president if he turned crazy or he turned a traitor. And then this team was designed to pre prevent a U.S. president from launching a nuclear strike for no reason. And because he could do it so quickly, this team was designed to shadow him everywhere he went. And if uh, key members of Congress and the Senate decided, hey, this guy's nuts, take him out, they would send a coded message to the team and they would take him out. And the, the, apparently when Alan Dulles was fired by Kennedy, he was the CIA director of the Bay of Pigs, uh, Alan Dulles stole the authorization code that applied to Kennedy. And then he sent the code to the team and they, just like people working in a Minuteman missile silo, once they get the launch codes, they turn the key. No questions asked. Once the assassination team got that code, which was Night to King 3, they started planning the assassination. They, no questions asked. Uh, they didn't, didn't have to uh, ver uh, you know, verify it. Once they got that code, they did it. They didn't know that the codes were stolen. And um, I've heard some people ask recently, why would you have a public shooting? It didn't matter. They, they would take him out at the first opportunity, where it be a motorcade, where it be a, a open air a speaking event like at Rice University. It didn't matter. The very first opportunity they got where it was a contained uh, area where they could shoot, they would take them out. In this case, it happened to be Dealey Plaza. They happened to be a goldfish bowl. I mean, you put a gunman anywhere around that park, you're shooting into a goldfish bowl. And he's trapped. He can't go nowhere. He's got to go right through the middle of it to escape the kill zone. And he's not going to escape. They got a gunman point, pointing a rifle at him at three different locations. So you feel there are three shooters? At least three. In my book, I think there are four shooters. I think one person was in the Dow Tex building. His name was uh, Eugene Hill Brading. The second gunman from the book depository, his name was Lauren Hall. The person who fired the throat shot was uh, Roscoe White, and the person who killed Kennedy was Louis D'Angelo Costello, a French Corsican Mafia hitman. See, in my book, I name names. I don't use them or they <clears throat> or persons unknown. I name suspects. And you gotta keep in mind, they're only suspects. None of these people have never been tried in a court of law. They're innocent until found guilty. So what do you feel Oswald's role was that day? The only thing Oswald had to contribute to make this whole thing work was clock in using his own handwriting on the time card. That's all he had to do. Show up, show up for work. He was trapped. They had him. Think about it. Henry Wade, the prosecutor, the only thing he really has to prove was I can prove he was in the building, folks. Look here. This is his time card. You see this handwriting? 
The FBI says this is his handwriting. He was in the building that day. He clocked in. That's it. Once you prove he was in the building, the people's going to assume he did it. If I was Oswald and I intended on shooting Kennedy, I wouldn't have clocked in. That way I could say, oh, whoa, wait a minute. I was sick that day. I, I didn't clock in that day. Why would you clock in in your place of employment if you're going to shoot the president? Does that make any sense? No. My book is based on common sense. A lot of these authors, a lot of these authors get mad at me. You know what my first qualified question is? Have you ever been a police officer? No. Why are you writing a book about murder if you don't know how to solve it? Make sense to you? And so, what do you feel happened then afterwards when Oswald left the scene? Was he just... Oswald really, Oswald really didn't know what was going on. If you study his behavior on the hours and hour, uh, uh, hours after the assassination, first he thought it was a big joke. He was holding his hand, handcuffs up like John Jonesier. Ah, yeah, big deal. They, they arrested me for shooting the president. president. But as the hours progressed, he kept getting angrier and hostile. His, uh, his uh, replies to the press are very short and angered. And he finally realized, hey, these people aren't kidding. They're arresting me for killing Kennedy and shooting uh, Officer Tippett. He thought it was a big joke. He thought it was a mistaken of a, 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 identity or something like that. And so who do you think killed Tippett? It wasn't Oswald. There was five people closest to the Tippett shooting. Uh, three of these five people failed to pick Oswald out of two police lineups until a newspaper got conveniently circulated through the jail. And then on the third lineup, they said, oh, yeah, that's him. Two lineups, th three of the closest people failed to identify him. And the uh, description of the guy more resembles Jack Ruby than Oswald. Well, I, I think Ruby was a cleanup guy. And Tippett, there's a rumor that they wanted uh, Tippett to drive also to Redbird uh, Airport to be flown out of Dallas. This is just a rumor. I don't know if it's true or not. But Tip, I think Tippett refused to do it, so, so Ruby killed Tippett. You know, uh, Ruby was left here to clean up the loose ends. Some people tell me that the parade run was changed, and other people tell me that it wasn't. Ah, that's not true. That's not part of a conspiracy. Uh, if you look at the car, the presidential limousine sat approximately five and a half inches off the ground. The uh, Main Street, the curbs in 1963 were seven inches tall. What they were planned to do was cross over from Maine to Elm to get on the freeway to head north, but they were afraid that the car would bottom out on the curb and get stuck. So they changed the route. They sent a, a, a physical security survey to the secret, secret Service four days prior to the assassination, and they changed the route four days prior to the assassination. It was publicized. So that was not part of a conspiracy. That was just practical need. Well, they had to in order to get the president to the Dallas trademark. Well, the only bullet that I'll swear to as being found was in 1978. It, it was a largely whole bullet found on the triple underpass. On top of the underpass, a man was using a metal detector, and the FBI looked at it and measured it. It had the same caliber as Oswald's rifle, but because it was so corroded and rusted, they couldn't identify it as being from his weapon. You have to understand, there, there used to be a uh, loser from the FBI that worked here in Dallas. Uh, in the days and weeks after the assassination, he used to throw bullets on the ground. And people used to pick him up and turn him into the Dallas police. Uh, and Dallas police had a coffee can saying JFK bullets. And they 
dropped the bullets in the coffee can. Finally, uh, when the FBI director in Washington found out that it was an FBI agent throwing these bullets on the ground, he got, uh, he got transferred out of Dallas. So why would he do that? Huh? Why would he do that? Yeah, joke. That's a joke. They'd run to, hey, I found a bullet from Daily Plaza. It must be one of, uh, from the assassination. Oh, yeah, yeah, click, you know. What do you think of the uh, monument on your, on your window here? Well, you have to understand that they only had $220,000 to work with. That's a real coarse material. It's not really decor-oriented. Decor and uh, you have to understand, too, that the Kennedy family couldn't care less about that monument. Yeah, uh, Jackie refused to come to Dallas again for any reason. In fact, she wouldn't even fly over the airspace of Dallas. Uh, they asked her to come to the de de dedication of this. She said, no, not only no, but hell no. They asked her to come to the opening of the Sixth Floor Museum. It's the same response. In fact, she, she told a family member that if the Soviet Union ever launched a nuclear strike, she hoped the first target was Dallas. And she actually said that. I mean, she hated this place for understandable reasons. Did you know people who hated Dallas after that happened? Well, Dallas was stereotyped as a uh, nutcase city after the assassination. A lot of people, uh, including myself, thought that after the assassination. If, if there was any ironic good thing that came about and you would think there would be no good thing coming as a result of assassination Dallas was forced to make itself go through a professional public relations program to be a friendly city and it has I tell you what this is the most friendly city I've ever seen when when I came here I've never had a problem with anybody in this city nobody and they always seem to kind of go out of their way to help you. But th these are, you have to understand too, but these are deep Southern, uh, uh, Southern um, Americans. And if you mess with them, they will mess with you back. You know, they're, they're reserved and they're conservative. But if, if you tick them off, they will respond to you. But it's a real friendly city. It really is. So you like it's more places. friendly than Indianapolis. Well, long story. I don't think you have enough tape to tape it, all right? Yeah. But you like Texas. Huh? Oh, yeah. I wasn't born here, but I got here as fast as I could. Um, can you tell me the story of where you were on that, on that day that Kennedy was shot? Yeah, I was in, a second, I was in the second period study hall in a elementary school, and... You know, that was a strange feeling. If you ever watch Indi Independence Day and you see that big cloud coming across New York City, the, the UFO, that, 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 that was a cloud of, of gloom that you could actually feel. You know, one second everybody was getting ready for Thanksgiving Day, football day, a uh, 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 very short three or four day school vacation day. Everybody's, you know, usually excited. And all of a sudden, no cars on the street. Nobody walking around. And I was real young, but you could sense something bad had happened. And then the uh, uh, principal got on the intercom and said, um, boys and girls, the President of the United States has been killed in Dallas, Texas. We were so young, we couldn't understand the word assassination, much less spell it, you know. And he said, President of the United States has been killed in Dallas. And then about two minutes later, he said, school's dismissed, go home. And you, you could tell, there's hardly any cars driving around. You know, people were crying. Uh, mainly women were crying here and there and got home and, and you know my mom had to explain it, what happened and all weekend you could hear that 
or the last thing you could remember of the whole thing were those drums on Monday of the funeral. It seemed like you could hear those drums all day long. And like when uh, Oswald got shot by Ruby, I was in the backyard playing touch football. My dad ran out. Hey, that guy who killed Kennedy just got shot on TV. I said, Dad, they don't kill real people on TV. He said, well, they just did. Uh, did, you, did, you go, did you see it then after that? Or? That what? Did you see a replay of that after Oh, that? yeah, sure, yeah. Did yeah. you watch the funeral stuff and everything? Well, a little bit of it. You know, I was, I was still kind of... Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Did you watch the funeral stuff and everything? Well, a little bit of it. You know, I was I was still kind of young. I, to me, it was a great five-day vacation from school. We got two extra days off, you know. So, eight or nine, something like that. Um, can you talk about some of the other things that the conspiracy museum deals with besides John Kennedy assassination? Well, we we uh, we tried to tell people about the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. We have the uh, assassination of Lincoln, and people say, "Now, come on, you're trying to tell us there was a conspiracy with Lincoln." Well, yeah, there was four people that were hung as a result of it, and we take them back here and show them the picture of the people hanging. And we also have a UFO Roswell exhibit downstairs, and people laugh about that. And they say, How, what's that got to do with a conspiracy? I said, well, it's only cost us $163 million to cover it up. Uh, Area 51 cost $71 million by itself. Only to have our government say, it doesn't exist. So something's going on with flying saucers and UFOs. So what do you think happened at Roswell? I, I'm going to tell you my own personal theory. After hundreds of years of space travel and flying through ra radiation belts, I think that these people, these aliens, their bodies evolutionize itself mainly through space travel or for space travel. Their skins got tougher, their, their eyes, you know, they developed sort of a, a shade to protect their eyes. And on one bright sunny day, uh, one of them went to their doctor and they found out you can't reproduce yourselves anymore. The, the, that radiation you were flying through all these years has damaged your DNA strand. So they came to Earth hoping that we would help them with our DNA, which was similar, to fix their DNA so they could once again reproduce their race. And then in exchange, I think they have given us t uh, technology. Or, I mean, our government's not killing anybody to give them DNA. I mean, after people die and stuff like that. But uh, I think we are helping them save their race, and they are helping us with technology that we never dreamed of before. Like a computer chip the size of a pinhead that can hold the enti entire encyclopedia, things like that. I mean, that, that's what I think. And that's what you think Area 51 is That's what Roswell and Area 51 is about. See, in 1947, there were not one but two UFOs over Roswell. One got hit by a lightning bolt, and it crashed into the other. There were seven aliens inside these two ships, and six of them died. One died two weeks later. Now they were taken to Fort Worth. The bodies of the aliens and pieces of the wreckage were taken to Fort Worth and then they were flown out to uh, another Air Force base in Ohio and when Area 51 was built then they were finally transferred to Area 51. And eventually uh, other aliens of that race came to Earth and they just sat down and made first contact with us as humans and said, look, we need your help. We're a dying race. We're dying out. We cannot reproduce our young anymore. 
If you help us with that, we'll help you with this. Now what this is, I, I don't know. But that's just my opinion. That's what I think. Right. And where is Area 51 in Nevada? It's somewhere in Nevada. You can't find it on the map, but they call it Gloom Lake. Uh, uh, no, f fantasy land. I, 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 I kind of like it when the Independence Day, uh, the president's flying in the air after Washington gets hit, and that uh, the father of that computer geek, he, uh, y'all knew about Area 51. Uh, 47 years ago, you knew about the, all this. And the president says, uh, sir, as president, I assure you, there is no aliens and there is no Area 51. And the CIA director goes, Mr. President, that's not exactly correct. And then the geek goes, which part? <laughs> I think that's so funny. <laughs> so do you think that the presidents are that out of the loop on things? No, I, I think, well, you know, that's interesting. If they honestly don't know about it, they can claim possible denial. They can honestly say, hey, they, no one told me about it. And, but on the other hand, uh, I think when they're elected president, they do have a, a very comprehensive security briefing by the CIA and the FBI. So I think more likely they do know about it. Especially if we're helping them with DNA and they're helping us with technology, he would have to be sort of in on that kind of deal. In fact, President Reagan, his, his main fear as president was an alien invasion. President Carter has admitted to seeing UFOs. So it's not, a, you know, it's not as dumb and funny and foolish as people th think it is. And that's why, uh, that's why I put the, that exhibit downstairs. Um, when you mentioned the Lincoln conspiracy, All right. uh, I'm familiar with the people that Booth was meeting with and stuff, but do you think it went beyond well, they were not involved with the shooting. Right. Booth shot Lincoln by himself. They were involved with his aid and escape afterwards because these were Southern people. They hated Lincoln. They were uh, s sympathizers to Booth. And naturally, when, they, when the government found out their involvement, they were uh, hung, including one woman. A lot of people don't know there's a woman hung. So you don't feel like the government was involved in that? Well, some people think that uh, uh, Lincoln's vice president, John Johnson, who became President Johnson, was uh, involved somehow, and the Secretary of War, uh, Stanton, was involved. Yeah. And that's a weird coincidence, because a lot of people now think that Kennedy's Johnson was behind his assassination. And then as far as um, RFK, what do you think? Well, let me tell you, have you ever heard of the magic bullet theory? In RFK's assassination, there were seven magic bullets. Sirhan Sirhan's gun, we do have the, we have the actual gun here that we think killed Bobby Kennedy. And uh, Sirhan Sirhan's 22 revolver could only be shot eight times. There were at least 15 bullets recovered in the pantry. That's seven magic bullets floating around, all right? All four shots that hit Bobby came from behind him. Sirhan Sirhan was always in front of him. Now, how could these bullets hit Bobby Kennedy from the rear? Unless, of course, he was using Australian boomerang bullets. Well, my personal opinion, I think, uh, I think James Earl Ray killed King. I, I don't think there was a conspiracy with King. If you notice, we don't even, we don't even mention King on our exhibits because I, I really don't think the government, uh, as far as a national figure like King, that they would let an innocent man uh, d die in prison. They're pretty much convinced he did it. Now, the King family thinks 
James Earl Ray was innocent, but I think they were more or less, uh, they felt sorry for him because he was dying of cancer. Um, what did you think of Oliver Stone's film? Well, it was a good film. It's 80% uh, accurate, 20% Hollywood, but that's the way a Hollywood format film is made. It's not like a documentary. And uh, like Oliver Stone said, if he had put all the footage uh, that he had taped for the movie JFK, that, that film or that movie would have been at least two days long. You'd have had to camp out to go see it. And that, I think there were a few parts he should have put in, like the <clears throat> Three Hobos, Badge Man, but he just couldn't do it. He had to limit it tried to limit it as short as he, a typical Hollywood film is 90 minutes. His is like nearly three hours long. And that, that's very unusual for a Warner Brothers to produce a film that long, it really is. It's like three hours and 20 minutes or something like that. Pretty good show though. And do you think that's what made the plaza popular again? artificially. After the movie JFK came out, oh yeah, they, all these tourists came out of the woodwork. Oh, we're, we're so concerned. Oh yes, we think it was conspiracy, but 1991 or 92 when the movie came out, it's this level. It's been doing this ever since. The interest has dropped. It's, it's dropping still today. Uh, when this place opened, we used to get like 75 to 100 people a day. Nowadays, we're lucky if we get 15 people a day in here. I've seen funeral homes more active in this place. So, what keeps the doors open here? Good question. I, I like to know the answer to that myself. That's a good question. I have no idea what's keeping the doors open, these lights on. I, I don't know. It's not that cash register, I'll tell you that. I'm serious. Can you tell me about the guy who owns this place? He's an eccentric uh, uh, millionaire out of Massachusetts named R.B. Cutler. Nice guy, dead set in his ways. You can't change his mind. He thinks there were like 15 shots fired. Uh, he thinks the umbrella man fired poison dart in Kennedy's throat that no one believes. But when you're worth $40 million, you can put anything on the walls you want. I told him one day, I said, RB, people think your museum sucks. And he said, well, I don't care. It's my money. I'll put on the walls what I care to. They don't have to come in the door. And that's the way millionaires think. That's just the way they are. They really don't care. And that's, you, that's the way he talks, by the way. What do you, uh, do you still feel anything when you walk in a dealer closet and still do anything? Really? Not really. I mean, I, I look around and, and it brings back the event, but I don't know. I've, over the years, I, I've, I've mellowed out a little bit. I'm not as gun-ho as I used to be. I used to wear a red t-shirt. Who killed JFK on the back? Not Lee Harvey Oswald. Things like that. You know, I mean, when you get older, you get 40, 50 years old, and you still wear red T-shirts like that, people think hey, there's something wrong with this guy. You know, I have to act my age. You know. So, what do you think uh, the plaza will mean 50 years from now? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I, I, I'll be surprised if it's still there 50 years from now. It'll probably turn into a parking lot. I'm serious. Nothing sacred in Dallas. Nothing. They would tear down the book depository if they had a, a similar use for that l location. They'd, they'd tear it down tomorrow. There are a lot of historical buildings have been torn down in this city that a lot of people feel shouldn't have been touched. Nothing sacred in this town. What do you feel about the effort to try to name a, rename a street for Kennedy? 
it's a big deal. There's been do hundreds of streets named after Kennedy around the world. Well, what's going to make a difference of one more? Um, do you happen to know anything about the about G.B. Dealey, the plaza is named after? About G.B. Dealey. Okay, uh, John Bannerman Dealey. He was a journalist, and his family was rich. And to tell you the truth, he, he didn't know nothing about running a newspaper, which was the Dallas Morning News. But he hired the people who did know. He loved to gamble. He loved the fist fight. And he was a, you know, he was a <laughs> rough, rough around the edges, <clears throat> rough around the edges society guy. And he did a, a, a lot of his money went to improving the uh, children's quality in Dallas, like a uh, public school system, he uh, treated them to finer arts, libraries, stuff like that. Actually, he was a pretty, pretty nice guy, as far as kids were concerned. Don't, don't gamble with him, though. So you think it's appropriate that the plaza was named after him? Didn't matter. If they'd won the plaza, they would have found a building to name after him, or a street, or telephone pole, or whatever. It, it didn't matter. In fact, the, the plaza was named after him before he died. And that's quite an honor when they name something after you before you die. Usually, they wait till after you die. Twenty till ten. Twenty till ten. Okay. Um, is there anything else that I kind of neglected to ask you about? Something you feel like needs to be said? No, I'm kind of surprised you haven't asked me anything about nine eleven. Okay. What do you think about nine eleven? Well, think about it. For the second time in American history, first time being Pearl Harbor, the second time in American history, an enemy force travels over 2,000 miles in secret using, aerial, uh, using an aerial attack, a method of explosion, and a sneak attack against U.S. soil, and for the second time, uh, just under uh, 3,000 people lost their lives in a sneak attack, only because we then learned from the first time. I think that uh, Homeland Security should have started on December 12th, 1941, not this time, but the first time. If we had had Homeland Security in place for, for nearly 50 years, 9-11 wouldn't have happened. As, as an historian, it's the old saying, if we fail to learn from history, if we fail to learn our lessons from history, it's going to happen again. And this time, it happened again. So do you have any doubts about who was behind 9-11 or any of that? Well, there's an interesting book that just came out by Jim Mars. It's there on the counter. Uh, it's the 9-11 conspiracy. Uh, Jim Mars feels, just like a lot of people thought about President Franklin Roosevelt, that the administration knew that 9-11 was going to happen. But the only problem in both instances, both the Japanese attack and 9-11, is that they knew something was going to happen, and soon, that they didn't know when and where. So, I mean, you don't feel like the government necessarily... Some people think they did. I, I don't. Some people think that the Bush administration somehow staged on 9-11 that don't, that don't make any sense to me. And what do you think of the Bush administration since then, what they've done? Well, I'll put it this way. During the election, I told people that it was getting kind of gory, so they should stay out of the bushes. And since 9-11, what do you think of what's happened? Uh, I don't dislike the, uh, President Bush, but I'm not too impressed with him. Uh, he, he's just about as dry and as boring as his dad. I do not like 
how he's using his big brother uh, artificial, I don't know who gave him this authority, his big brother power to ban the media from covering uh, flag draped coffins being offloaded in Dover by uh, banning on the scene combat uh, coverage over there and uh, ban foreign protests against our troops on foreign soil. I, I'd like to know who gave him this authority. The Constitution says that the media and jur journalists have freedom of speech. He's banning them from telling the American people, hey, this is what's going on right now. You people need to see this. And uh, he, he's just trying to mellow everything out. Marshmallows, roses. Oh, it's a friendly war. People aren't getting killed as much. It's not as bad as you think. Well, it is as bad as you think. If they say one person got killed today, you better believe that at least a dozen people got killed that day. If they say 10 people got killed that day, you better believe there had to be at least 40 or 50 people got killed that day. Just like Vietnam, it's the same old thing. You know what Kennedy was supposed to eat that day at the Dallas trademark? I mean, even in the White House or anything. Why? Do you know what Kennedy was supposed to eat at the Dallas trademark? What? Stuffed peppers. You know what everybody had to order? All, all 200 guests? Stuffed peppers. Everybody had the same thing. So you have two, 220 plates in front of you. Which one's Kennedy's? You don't know. I mean, why not? If a conspiracy could get that many people to fire that many guns and then fake evidence afterwards, why not just give one person the poisonous food at the White House and then fake evidence on a much smaller scale? What you're doing is Monday morning quarterbacking history. Don't, don't, don't worry about stuff like that. Let's look at the facts. Stick to the facts and don't what if, what if, what if, what if. I'm not asking what if, but I'm asking... Yes, you are. You just asking, did. No, I'm asking if you were a conspirator. I'm, I'm beginning to feel like Dr. Phil, but go ahead. If you were a conspirator, mm -hmm. why would you plan a public shooting in front of cameras? In front they of didn't like him. They hated him. Why would you even make it known that he was publicly killed? Why not just have... They didn't make it known... Um, be sure to be at Dealey Plaza Friday, November 22nd. We're going to shoot the president uh, on that day, so bring, bring a camera. Uh, Why not just say that he died of a heart attack? Why not just say that he died of a heart attack? Why not is the same as uh, what if. I, I'm not going to go into that. I'm not going to do it. But, I mean, you've never asked the question of... I, I, I'm, not going, I'm not going to go into that. you never asked the question of why a conspiracy would plan a shooting rather than something much simpler. I don't know. I don't care. What is it? I don't care. I only deal with the facts. He was shot in an open car on a street called Elm in a, a city called Dallas. All right. Take that off. So okay. Just... Well, did do you all right? Yeah, we can just drop these comments. <clears throat> You know, when, when I stopped looking at you and looked at the camera, that, that's what Dr. Phil does all the time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I, I'm a big fan of Dr. Phil. Oh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> see, this is that book I was took, 9-11, and six seconds in Dallas is up there. Hey, do you want to get a picture of it? Yeah, can I just kind of run the camera past here? Is it a thing on uh, the assassination? Or? Yeah. yeah, that's true. In fact, I'm going to be on TV, and uh, uh, I'm also going to be uh, in a French magazine. <laughs> I think it's about 30, right? There you go. 
I've never thought of it before. Is there any nationality that you see more than others? That's kind of interesting. Mainly, ma mainly English. The number one uh, foreign nationality is English tourists, and followed closely by Germans. No way, I'll take that back. It's English and Japanese, and then German. Mm -hmm. I know when I interviewed. Mainly, ma mainly English. The number one uh, foreign nationality is English tourists, and followed closely by Germans. No way, I'll take that back. It's English and Japanese, and then German. Mm -hmm. I know when I interviewed people at random, I got more English than others in the plaza, but I wasn't sure if that was just the time or. Yeah. You know, I've done this so long, I can't even sound like Kennedy. <laughs> oh, yeah? yeah you want to do this on tape? <laughs> sure. Just, to, this will pick you up. Close enough. Tell me when you're ready. All right, I'm ready. Now, folks, I've done this so long, I can't even sound like John F. Kennedy. You ready? Okay, listen up. Mr. President, do you think it's fair for our men overseas to be sent abroad? No, most of us, certainly not. I think our men uh, certainly can uh, pick up their own women, yes. Mr. President, what do you think of Bill Clinton? Well, I uh, never knew him personally, but I think Maryland had more class than Monica. <laughs> I've always thought that, too. <laughs> that was it close? Oh, that was good. Okay. Well, I like the... The things you chose to say, too. <laughs> you know, the funniest thing he, he ever said, today the National Space Administration prepares to launch the largest payroll, uh, payload in the space. Uh, well, wait a minute. I suppose I'm right. It would be the largest payroll, too, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> and he also said, but... Mr. President, this is your 100th day in office. Would, would you have ran knowing what you know now? Would you recommend it to your best friend or thinking about being reelected? The answer uh, to your question is uh, yes, no, yes. Now, next question. <laughs> I think I've actually seen that one. Yeah. Yes, no, yes. Next Can I get those three brothers up there? Do I? The three brothers. Oh, I'm just going to zoom in on the three sure. brothers. Sure. I mean, take care of you. All right. All right. You would think people would have uh, mutual respect when they come into a place like this. We've got to put signs up actually asking people not to use this floor as a trash can. Sad. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind, I'll take my last couple minutes and just pay. Sure, go ahead. Right. And, 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 you know, people, uh, and what really gets me is people, after they go to the Six Floor Museum, they still ask, ask basic questions. Which window was it? <laughs> you just came out of the damn museum. You still don't know which window it was? Maybe that's why Dr. Phil is so successful. He knows how to talk to people. So we have a man shooting out a six floor window, shooting by himself, shooting Kennedy as a lone nut. How's that working for you?
great shot of that. Well, this is my master's thesis, right, for the University of North Texas. And then I will try, after I do my master's thesis, I'll try to get it into um, some documentary film festivals. Oh, okay. So hopefully get my name out there as you know, a filmmaker. All right. But I need to have it done for spring to get my master's thesis on time. So I will give you a copy of it then. Well, I think you're... I'm glad to see you're making a serious effort at it. You know, most, most people your age only, only want to know where the uh, nearest Mickey D is. You know? We know they just had that behavior is difficult. Once Kennedy made a remark that uh, uh, most people his age considered the death of Roosevelt very solemn and, and tragic event because they lived through it. And it's the same way with Kennedy. If you weren't born when he, he got shot, it's just a page in history book. You know? But people like me lived through it. It's just the same thing. Okay, I'm almost done. No problem. Hey, uh, as you can see, there's no uh, long uh, throbbing lines trying to get inside. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I've seen this place open for an hour and a half before somebody walks in. Hour and a half after we open. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. But seriously, you know, uh, most people think this place is a, a, a joke. We, we actually have people call our number thinking it's a gimmick line or something. And they're surprised when we actually say, conspiracy museum, and they, and they hang up on us. But you know what? The majority of people, after they come in, they thank us. And, uh, and they appreciate that this is a serious attempt to address the issue. Do you do anything to publicize? Huh? Did you do anything to publicize Yeah, this? we got ads and tourist books, stuff like that. Because one of the questions I've asked people when I you know, was in the plaza was if they were aware of the conspiracy museum. And I was surprised how many people were not aware that it was over here. Yeah. 
have people call us up all the time. Is this the JFK Museum? There is no JFK Museum in Dallas, Texas. There is no museum called the JFK Museum. Look it up. Look in phone book. You know, you're not going to find one called that. I'm not lying to them. <laughs> the official 6-4 museum uh, walking tour? Yeah, 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 yeah. You ready? Oswald did it. Okay, there it is. You just got the entire tour.
There's a guy named Ernest Brandt. He claims to be a witness that was down there. Don't believe that son of a bitch. Now, on these, on these Saputer films, it shows Brandt, the guy he says is him. It shows him, uh, it shows this guy with a pipe in his mouth. On the 30th anniversary, I walked up to Ernest and I said, Ernest, when did you stop smoking? I've never smoked a day in my life. Then you're busted, because the guy you say is you has a pipe in his mouth. What'd you say? And they always make a big deal. Oh, yes, this, yes, this is uh, Mr. Jenkins. Uh, we are talking to world famous eyewitness Ernest Brandt. Every anniversary, they make him up to be such a big deal. I said, Ernest, the guy in the uh, uh, Saputer film's got a pipe in his mouth. I thought you said you never smoked a day in your life. Are you lying? I think you're lying, Mr. Brandt. And I'm bigger than you, and you're not going to do anything about it. And hey, what does he say to that? I mean, does he just... He just... <laughs> walks away. What can he say? He's busted. The guy's clearly got a pipe in his mouth, and he says he's never smoked a day in his life. He, I caught him lying, you know. It's like that like other guy, Harold Norman, the black guy in the fifth store, fifth story window. You know, I heard the bullet action, the rifle, click boom, click boom, click boom. Well, I, I walked up to him like a Fox Motor, the X Files. You know, that, that's why I generally act with people. You know, I like Motor. I said, "Gee, Harold, come here. The blueprints of the building. You know, these floors are 18 inches thick. How in the world could you hear the bolt action, the rifle, and cartridges sitting for?" Well, I did. I said, "No, you didn't." I said, "All right, so there's two. There's only two possibilities. Did they fire a 155 howitzer from the window?" to have the cartridge about this big? No. Harold, did you shoot the president? That's the only other possibility. He did. Well, he never talked to me after that. For some reason, he always got kicked out of that. See, I mean, I can't help it. I'm an ex-cop. I check out little minute details like that. Right. And then, you know? Yeah, I just watched the original one. You know that guy that they named Monk, or Richard Belsner? Yeah. You know, sometimes I sit here like him, I put these shades on, and I just look at people. <laughs>
these are these are my monk shades right here. You know. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. Sure. I'm sure I will see you around. Well, well, let me know how for you. <laughs> let me know how your uh, thesis, what, what kind of grade you get on. All right. I will. And I will uh, give you a copy of the DVD. I'll find a copy of the right now. You don't have to. All right. <laughs> hey, I mean, if you want to, fine. But it's, it, it'll be dirt But if you do, address it to me personally. So none of these other assholes will open it up. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you.